Hello and welcome to Watchdog. On tonight's programme, why you should watch out when buying abroad by credit card. And I'm watching the Watchdogs again, back on the beat this week in the company of dear old George Dixon and asking, what sort of deal do you get if you complain about the police? But first, every day, somewhere in Britain, someone is shaking one of these at us, a charity collection tin. When we slip our coins into the slot, we fondly imagine most of our money will go to the worthy cause. And with most charities, it does. But Watchdog has uncovered one organisation, Theatre Aid, whose collecting activities seem anything but charitable. Sue Bishop reports. Finningley Air Show in South Yorkshire. It's a spectacle which has attracted nearly 200,000 people. They're here to have a good time and dip into their pockets to support the many worthy causes who come to events like this to raise money. One of the groups here asking for donations is called Theatre Aid. It's run by Gary Knight with his wife, Michelle Edwards. Theatre Aid promotional girls are selling raffle tickets at a pound a time. The prize is a spin in a racing car, and your money is going to help save British theatres threatened with closure. Well, that's the story. The truth, however, is very different. Theatre Aid launched itself on the fundraising scene with these ads. Girls, girls, girls. Promotional girls required for Formula One Ferrari exhibition team. Well, I saw this guy called Gary Knight, and he said, and uh, we went for this interview, there's about three girls, and he said that we can earn up to, well, 100, between 100 and 200 pounds a day selling raffle tickets. Um, he did explain to me that you'd never see him drive around in flash cars, which obviously he said that, you know, the money's for charity. They said it was for British theatres, in particular the Young Vic. Um, he said he was involved with all the theatres, he could get tickets, and, you know, he knew them really well. The money being raised by the girls was due to end up here, at the Young Vic, one of Britain's most important independent theatres. Now, despite the fame of its actors and the relative popularity of its plays, the Young Vic has hit on hard times recently. Its building is literally falling down and they just don't have the money to repair it. So when in May, Theatre Aid appeared on the scene and offered them £50,000, well, it was pennies from heaven. They said they would be selling raffle tickets in various public places for a family holiday to Florida and that these tickets would cost a pound. 50p would be their costs, the salaries of people and so on. Um, 25p would be their profit and 25p in the pound would come to the Young Vic. Um, and that we, would, we should expect to get a minimum of £2,000 each week. I did recoil 23 years. Unless the theatre does get the money it needs, stars like Trevor Eve, here rehearsing Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, won't have much of a theatre to play in. How like me thought I then was to this colonel, this squash. Usually in Shakespeare, I think... After three weeks, the young Vic were expecting around £6,000. Theatre aid, however, had other ideas. I had a, a letter from Michelle Edwards, who is their chairperson, saying they'd raised £1,368 for us and that this would be delivered as soon as possible. Well, it didn't happen, but I had a conversation with Gary Knight that said that sum had now gone up to £2,500 and that he would be in on the 30th of July to hand the money over, which was great. That also didn't happen, so we had a number of telephone conversations which were met, you know, with a sort of blank wall answer, really. Um, and the, the result of innumerable telephone conversations and faxes and letters was a further letter from Michelle Edwards saying that, in actual fact, the amount that they'd raised for us was £510, not 1300 or 2500 but it had gone down. Um, and we haven't heard anything from them since. So Sally Giles and a colleague visited Gary Knight at his North London offices. They wanted to know where their money had gone. Given his habit of changing his story every five minutes, the young Vic agreed that Watchdog should secretly record their conversation. The excuses came thick and fast. Gary's first excuse, key venues like Brands Hatch don't let charities in anymore. It's everyone, even if you tried to self, you'd find out that they, um, 
It wouldn't allow you in to brain sex regardless of what you're offering. Yes. Not true. Brands Hatch officials say theatre aid are banned because they broke circuit rules, but other charities are, as always, welcome. <laughs> Gary's second excuse, venues are expensive. The only way of getting them cheap is to have a charity number, and they wouldn't dream of using the Young Vicks. A lot of people uh, do ask you, they say, you know, what's your charity number? And if you if you, you obviously can't give them yours because we're not actually, although we're, you know, supportive, we're not yeah. you, you see, so yeah. we can't do that. Not true. This application form for a stand at Silverstone shows they have misled organisers by giving the impression the Young Vic's charity number belongs to them. But at least the money raised had now apparently gone up again. Off the top of your head, yeah. I mean, have you sold 10,000 tickets or 1,000 tickets? Or yeah, no, we've sold tickets, about 12, uh, 15,000 tickets. Yeah. By his own admission, Gary has raised at least £12,000. So a minimum of 3,000 is owed to the young Vic. But they left that day with nothing but promises. This time, they were going to get full accounts and the cheque within seven days. A week later, they got a letter promising just £510 and enclosing the first 200. And they had the cheek to complain that the young Vic had... No real concern for the future well-being of the Aid. And they had no alternative but to... Terminate our relationship. But just a week afterwards, on September the 8th, Watchdog discovered Theatre Aid back in business. At Stanborough Fair in Hertfordshire, they were still collecting money for the Young Vic. The Young Vic Theatre Auditorium, St Judas Bench started a registered charity called Theatre Aid. Are you selling tickets? Yes, yes, it is. It's a pound, £1. And after that, on September the 18th at Waterloo Station, they were caught again. No prizes for guessing who the apparent beneficiaries were. On September the 21st, at yet another Young Vic venue, we asked Gary Knight Hello. just what was going on. Hi, Anne. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, my name's Sue Bishop. I'm from the Watchdog programme at the BBC. Hello, Anne. You seem to be making a reasonable amount of money today. I'd just like to ask you where the money is that you owe the Young Vic Theatre. Well, we're actually not arranging with the Young Vic Theatre. We're paying them a cheque each week. Did I not tell you that? They did, but they are supposed to have had £510 by now. They've only had 200 I don't think so. That's not what the agreement I actually gave them. I just said to them that we're sending them on a weekly basis so that our little organisation can exist. And that's what we've actually honoured. Why are you still using the Young Vic's name to raise money when you don't have an arrangement with them anymore, There's as no you just said? Uh, representing the Young Vic Theatre here. Today. Well, I can tell you that uh, we have taped evidence from this very day that your girls are telling people that it's being raised for the Young Vic. We have filmed evidence of this as well from weeks previously. Well, I mean, to my knowledge, there's not anyone here representing the Young Vic. I think um, it's all the girls that I've spoken to, especially our supervisors. I've explained that situation with the Young Vic. I've also explained to them how unsympathetic they are towards our own organisation now we'd be much better raising funds to for elsewhere. So that's what we're actually doing. Well, given that your ladies have been using the Young Vic's name in order to get people to donate this money, will you be prepared to give them some more now? For the Young Vic Theatre? Yes. No, that's all. So if he wasn't raising money for the Young Vic, who was he raising it so for? You were raising money today for yourself? Yes, that's right. We're actually running money for our own organisation, which is quite an acceptable thing to do. All organisations should have sure got to do that. Because uh, we need money to exist, don't we? So everyone has lost out. The kind-hearted people who put money in the cans. The girls who thought they were raising money for charity. And, of course, the young Vic. Only one person stands to gain from all this. Gary Knight himself. Sue, you have some late news on Gary Knight. We have indeed. At the end of last week, he left his offices without paying his bills. Now, we know this isn't the first time that he's raised money, apparently, for charity, which has by no means been satisfactorily accounted for. We also know that he's been fundraising at at least 20 events across Britain in the last few months, but nobody knows where the money's gone. All we do know is that he owes money all over the place. What are the charity commissioners doing about him? Well, they do their best, but the current laws are so vague that it's very difficult for them to actually do anything. Um, of course, Theatre Aid were a voluntary group and not a charity. I gather there's a new law in the offing. Tell us about that. 
That's right. The, uh, the government looks likely to reform its charity fundraising law in this coming session of Parliament. That means that th groups like Theatre Aid would have to tell people, look, we're not a charity, we're being paid to fundraise, and they'd have to say what percentage of that money is going to charity. So let's hope it'll be enough to stop the Gary Knights of this world taking advantage. Let's hope so. Sue, thank you very much. Now, a cautionary tale for anyone who's ever been tempted to buy jewellery on holiday abroad. While Stephanie Tennyson from Ashton under Lyme was on holiday in the island of Crete this summer, she had a birthday. Her husband Martin treated her to that lovely gold necklace you can see her wearing there. It's 14 karat gold and cost £280 from a smart jewellery shop in her sunny sauce. Now the shop was adorned with credit card symbols like this, so the Tennysons paid by their Visa National and Provincial card. And look, the shop wrote gold, 14k, 14 karat, as a description on the voucher. Back in England in August, Stephanie decided to have a valuation done in her necklace. How much do you think her local jewellers valued it at? £280? More? The answer is a fiver. Here's why. This is actually Stephanie's gold necklace. Remember, this cost £280 and it is really just cutlery grade steel. There is a gold clasp there. That's the only bit and the rest is rubbish. Now, if you buy something in this country by credit card which costs more than £100, the credit card company is jointly liable with the seller if things go wrong and they could have to refund your money. As the Tennysons had bought this with their visa card, they thought the national and provincial should be liable in some way. National and provincial thought different. They told the Tennysons that they had no right to anything because the credit card laws only apply in this country. In desperation, Stephanie contacted us. We rang Visa International, the national and provincial are members of theirs. They rang the Greek bank who licensed the jeweller in Crete. He said the necklace was part of an £800,000 gold fraud, but he agreed to give Stephanie back her money, and he has. The fact is, no one has tested in court whether we have any rights buying by credit card abroad. The companies can use a chargeback system where they give us our money back, then reclaim it from the shop, but it seems to be up to them when they do this. So if you're going to use one of these overseas, do watch out. Back in the 50s and 60s, dear old George Dixon did a great deal to boost public confidence in the police. Now both George and some of that confidence are gone. These days people complain about the police in increasing numbers. So if you feel unjustly treated, what sort of deal do you get? particularly if your grievance winds up being dealt with by the Police Complaints Authority. The authority is an independent watchdog body of civilians. If you complain about a police officer, they're supposed to make sure that other police officers who investigate that complaint do their job properly. Last year, the PCA handled some 5,000 complaints, and no doubt many of their customers went away satisfied. Others did not. The Smart family have always had strong ties with the forces of law and order. Peter's father was a policeman, his brother still is. And as the owner of a security alarm business, Peter himself is known to his local crime prevention officer. Indeed, the family's respect for the police was always second to none, until one June morning, two and a half years ago. It was 4.30 a.m. when 12 police officers arrived outside the smart home and shattered the family's sleep. First, they smashed through the front door of the house. The officers, some of them carrying guns, did not stand on ceremony. Within minutes, they were ordering a naked and bewildered Mr Smart to walk with them, at gunpoint, out of his house. His terrified wife and children, then aged just four and six, followed on behind. I was absolutely petrified, looking down the wrong end of a gun, however far away or however close it was to me at the time, was just a, an experience I would never want to go through again. Police subjected Mr Smart to his dawn humiliation in the mistaken belief that he might be able to help with inquiries into a murder that had taken place five days earlier. Then a man was shot during a fight between rival Hell's Angels. Within days, police had arrested and charged a man with murder. 
but they still felt justified in also arresting Mr. Smart because his driving license, an insurance note, and a motorcycle registered in his name were all found at the scene of the crime. It would appear that prior to the incident, I had lost my license, unbeknown to me, and whoever had found it had registered, or we assume had registered, you know, the bike in my name and also got uh, temporary insurance on it. Whatever the case, within hours of arresting him and causing £1,800 worth of damage to his home, the Metropolitan Police realised that in suspecting Mr Smart, they had pursued the wrong man. And although they eventually paid for the damage, in the view of the Smarts, the police failed to atone for their mistake. If we'd have had an apology very soon after the raid, and perhaps some compensation, or even have been allowed to have had the repairs carried out to the house, which took six to seven weeks before we were allowed to do that. If that had happened fairly quickly and willingly on their part, that would have helped us enormously. Instead of that, we just came up across this sort of brick wall of us continuously harassing them to get anywhere. Their faith in the Metropolitan Police seriously undermined, the Smarts made contact with the Police Complaints Authority a group of civilians who would supervise an investigation by other Metropolitan Police officers into their complaint. There were problems right from the start. First, the investigating officers lost the Smart's file, and throughout, the investigation seemed to proceed without them. It really was a, almost as traumatic as the raid itself. Very tedious, endless telephone calls, if it had been anybody less determined, then I don't think the complaint would have gone through. The Police Complaints Authority proclaims itself to be independent, powerful, thorough and fair. And we have no evidence to suggest that it's not. However, can it be seen to be all of those things when it considers cases like the Smarts in secret? The Deputy Chairman of the Police Complaints Authority is former industrialist Peter Morehouse. He cannot, by law, comment on individual cases. And although he thinks the investigations into complaints are thorough, he agrees that less secrecy would increase public confidence in the system. If we were permitted to be a little more open, the public would get a, a better appreciation of the objectivity and thoroughness with which we do our work. We see very thorough investigations, extremely thorough investigations, not just statements from the officers, not just statements from the witness complainant, but forensic evidence, evidence which could be defined as circumstantial, a total picture of the incident. It was a year after the raid on their house that the Smarts were told in this letter that their complaint was rejected, the authority taking the view that the police were justified in entering their home at 4.30 in the morning. The police also apologised for the distress and inconvenience caused. But the Smarts still aren't happy, never having liked the idea of police investigating police. As a member of the authority, what I'm interested in is the quality of the investigation. And if somebody can prove to me that a different body will produce a more thorough and a more objective investigation, then happily we will look at it. In the meantime, the smarts battle on. They still want compensation from the police and their names publicly cleared. This will mean reliving their ordeal in a civil court, but it's the only option left open to them. Gary Stretch is going down that road too, knowing that bringing errant bobbies to book through the Police Complaints Authority can be a tiresome and frightening business. It was November the 5th, fireworks night 1987, when Gary went into a pub for a drink. He came out beaten unconscious, with a ricked neck, severe bruising, a partially severed ear, and for a short while, blinded. He was unable to work in his job as a window cleaner for two years. The people Gary accused of inflicting those injuries were seven off-duty policemen who were initially suspended for three years on full pay and then sacked. Nevertheless, Gary still feels frustrated by the system. It's hard for me to explain to people when I say, well, I don't feel like I've got justice, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not really too bad for them. They was paid all the time they were suspended, full pay. You know, it's like a working holiday, if you like, you know. They could do what they want, whereas me, I'm still, like, walking around, feeling vulnerable, 
never knowing when it's going to end, you know. And I think the stress just wipes away any form of justice. While his son was recovering from his injuries, Gary's father lodged a complaint. With more than 20 witnesses to the incident, they thought they had a strong case. But to their astonishment, the director of public prosecutions said there was insufficient evidence on which to mount a criminal prosecution. However, it was decided that the seven police officers should face a disciplinary hearing, a police tribunal. At that tribunal, the officers denied the charges. Nevertheless, all seven were found guilty of discreditable conduct and sacked. The tribunal was heard in these police headquarters. Neither the press nor the public is allowed to attend these hearings, but Gary, as a complainant, was. It was just a never-ending nightmare every day I was there. You know, I just felt so isolated, so vulnerable, you know, in a room full of complete strangers. The tribunal was heard in a room something like this. Sitting in judgment on the case, two members of the Police Complaints Authority and a Deputy Assistant Commissioner from the Metropolitan Police. Presenting the case against the seven police officers, a barrister, who apart from his time in the witness box, never spoke to Gary once during the entire four weeks of the hearing. Defending the seven police officers who sat along here, four barristers. Gary, meanwhile, had just his dad. Police Complaints Authority rules forbidding complainants like Gary from taking their solicitors along to hearings like this. What's more, Gary was also banned from taking notes. Moreover, come the end of the hearing, although he heard the verdict against the seven police officers, he was never told officially what punishment was meted out to them. Now, no one is suggesting that anything improper went on here, but just ask yourself this. If you were Gary, facing all this lot, would you think the police complaint authority was independent and fair? Gary's solicitor, Raju Bhatt, certainly doesn't think so. I had always thought that a fundamental principle of justice is that justice should be seen to be done. I'm afraid we haven't seen justice to be done. And as far as Gary is concerned, the trauma of going through the disciplinary hearing in total isolation, in total secrecy, cannot be described as justice. The authority cannot, by law, respond to Gary's complaints. However, it has independently asked the government to make changes to the tribunal system. The authority have recommended very strongly that the complainant should be permitted to stay in the tribunal or the hearing throughout the complete proceedings, and that the complete proceedings should be open to the public. The authority believes that a public hearing would allay many of the criticisms made by people like Gary. Meanwhile, four years after he was attacked, Gary still needs legal advice. For the seven sacked police officers have now appealed to the Home Secretary. So this week, Gary is having to sit through another secret hearing into the case. After that, he'll have to go to another court to apply for compensation. If you have a complaint about the police, getting justice can take a very long time. I haven't had any form of compensation whatsoever from the night in general, you know, for my injuries. And I haven't had any form of apology from anyone, you know, not from the police, not from the police complaints authority, you know, not at all. Not even in questioning how my, my health is and how do I feel. You know, I've had nothing like that whatsoever. The Police Complaints Authority's recommendations for a more consumer-friendly system are with the Home Secretary. And it's up to the government to decide what should be done. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> Remember last week we showed you what not to do if you come across a motorcyclist injured in an accident? This party political broadcast gave the misleading impression it was fine to take a helmet off, when actually you should leave it on. Dr Lorna Dunlop wrote to us from Renfrewshire to ask if we'd seen the latest AA handbook's advice on the subject. Only remove the crash helmet if the casualty has difficulty doing so or is not breathing. Dangerous advice, because if the casualty is having difficulty, taking his helmet off could leave him paralysed. What you should do is leave well alone, unless you know exactly what you're doing. It usually takes two people to remove a helmet, and then only if the casualty is vomiting or has stopped breathing. The Automobile Association agree their advice is misleading, and they'll be changing it in the 1992 handbook. Now, have you ever lost a film after sending it off to one of the photo processing companies? Each year, thousands of rolls of film get lost in the post. 
as a taster to an investigation in next week's programme, here are some of the missing films. Are they yours? Do you recognise anybody? If you've spotted a bride or a soldier in the Gulf, let us know. The full report's next week. Now, John is in the doghouse. As the old saying goes, it pays to advertise. It also costs a great deal to advertise. If you happen to live in one of the London boroughs, we've got in the doghouse this week. How much do you think they want to charge Chris Lewis for putting this sign outside the office of his minicab company? Would you believe £400? His local council at Merton in South London are able to do this thanks to some well-meaning legislation brought in last year called the London Local Authorities Act. One of its aims was to control market stall holders like these who operate on the streets. But some councils, like Merton, are also using it as a way of extracting cash from ordinary shopkeepers. Consider for a moment what's been going on down Merton Way in the last few months. First, people like Dennis Moat, who runs his pet shop, got a letter from the council telling him that his rabbit hutches and hay were obstructing the footpath, and that if he didn't shift them, he might face a hefty fine. Quite a worry until six weeks later when the council came up with an offer Dennis couldn't refuse. This time they told him that under the new act, he could leave his stuff on the pavement if he applied for a street trader's licence, which would cost him £400. They meted out exactly the same treatment to several other shopkeepers, like the man who runs his tiny flower shop, and, of course, to our old mate Chris. In short, Merton seemed to be saying that these pavement displays are an obstruction unless you apply for a street trader's licence and pay them 400 quid, when magically the obstruction seems to evaporate. Now, in fairness to Merton, they say that the cost will deter shopkeepers from extending their businesses onto the pavements. This can, after all, make life difficult for pedestrians. What's more, they're not the only council in London charging shopkeepers for having displays on public footpaths. And they claim the £400 they charge each business does not mean vast profits for the council. That's simply what it costs them to administer the scheme. Funny then that in neighbouring Richmond, shopkeepers will only be charged £25 a year. Merton, consider yourselves in the doghouse. <laughs> And that's it for this week. Don't forget that on Watchdog, your trouble is our business. So don't hesitate to either ring or drop us a line. Our address and phone number will be on your screen in just a moment. And although we can't promise to reply to all your letters, believe me, they do all get read. Until the same time next week, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.